Hi, this is Stuart from worldofnlp.com once again, sharing with you language patterns from Neuro Linguistic Programming. For more information about Neuro Linguistic Programming and advanced training sessions available, head down to worldofnlp.com and just register yourself. Today, we're dealing with something called the meta model, and usually I will take at least half a day for practice and uh, hands-on stuff in order for people to get the hang of the meta model. So I'm just going to breeze through this and give you some relevant examples as to how this specific model has been a very core pillar of NLP since the beginning of its uh, development. So what is the meta model exactly? Well, basically it was created as a result of studying questions asked in therapy and some of the questions seem to be more specific and some of them seem to be more general. Essentially, some questions tended to be more effective in certain situations than others. So, Benlin Grinder got down to modeling the sequence and structure of language that was being used. So, different questions that lead to different explorations of the problem will generate different results. So, sometimes you'll find that those questions can actually help you to uncover the model of thinking and that's the basis of modeling so utilizing this model the meta model actually helps you to not just uncover thinking patterns that are problematic you also allow yourself to uncover thinking patterns that are patterns of excellence so here are three basic processes if you've not watched the uh, previous video that i created on deletion generalization and distortion I'd highly recommend that you do so, so that you understand that these are filters created as a result of our beliefs, values, memories, past decisions, our time filters, our language filters, our cultural filters, and so on. So here's a couple of examples as we go deeper into that. First of all, let's recap what surface and deep structure is all about. So for instance, I say John is a nice man. I could take it as a, a presumed fact. And usually whenever you're speaking with somebody else, someone who says, you know, so-and-so is a nice person, there's hardly any information other than that. And you tend to take that as a strong reference point, And that specifically gives you information that you distort. Literally, you have absolutely no idea who John is, what he looks like. Um, you have no idea what kind of personality he has, under what, what circumstances he was nice, and to what people he's nice. Of course, this may sound paranoid, but at the same time, we're not just talking about the surface structure in the syntax, John is a nice man, but we're also talking about the presumed assumptions that underlie that statement. So the deep structure requires us to understand a little bit more about who John is and what kind of features he has, which in and of itself is a very deep exploration. You know, understanding somebody else can be pretty uh, detailed and deep. I'm not saying that you have to do that, but sometimes you have to ask the question, who exactly are you talking about? Who is John? So that will uncover a little bit of the deep structure. Well, at, le at least enough for you to understand why this person came to a, a conclusion that John is a nice person. The next one, the equivalent, John equals nice man, is a distortion pattern. In other words, John is a nice man to you, but it may not necessarily hold to be true for other people's model of the world. Let's just say you have a certain map of your territory which maps John into the nice section of your database. But the same things, the same behaviors, the same demeanor that he exhibits might mean something else for someone else. And of course, the whole idea of nice. What exactly do you mean by nice? Um, do you mean <laughs> he treats you well? Does, do you mean he's very polite? Are you saying that he's willing to help you? Because all these other equivalences of nice have not appeared in this surface structure. And therefore, it leaves a lot of people to ask the question, what do you mean by nice? And it may end up with assumptions that were not even stated on the surface of this particular statement. So do be careful with this because when someone tells you, I'm skilled in karate, you may be able to say, okay, so someone is skilled in karate, but how do you know what evidence is there and who says that you're good in karate? What exactly does karate entail? And so on. That is a modeling question. You're basically finding out what a person means in a certain situation. When someone says, he made me depressed, sure, there is a cause and effect statement there, 
but it also means that there's a definition about what depression really is. It's a question about the, uh, the, the idea that someone else can make you feel a particular way. How, the, how did those ideas come into the picture? And that's very important when it comes to understanding the uh, deeper structure inside a person's statement. So think of the surface structure as something that gives you a clue about other questions you have to ask in order to get to the deep structure. So let's take a look at some of those patterns. The lesion patterns, like for instance, nobody listens to me. So uh, someone will say, so, uh, you know, so-and-so is uh, doing all of these things and nobody listens to me. So the question you should be asking is, so who hasn't been listening to you? Uh, usually when you are dealing with deletion patterns, the, the phrase like nobody um, gives you an idea that there's something missing, isn't it? And listen to you specifically to what? Because there are many deletion patterns here. How exactly should they be listening to you specifically? You know, these are other deletion patterns which are not even listed in this example. So what's the missing information? How do we extract this information? This is uh, a question for you to ask yourself so that you can find out a little bit more. And the next one, what's in a language structure that presupposes missing information? So when somebody says, nobody listens to me, um, we don't know who that nobody is or who those nobodies are. Uh, we have no idea what listening really means and under what context, under what situation. And maybe this particular situation is very unique and it may not mean nobody at all or else you know, I wouldn't have heard the question. <laughs> So let's take a look at distortion patterns. Uh, the person whom I'm speaking with will say leashing an animal is torture. So the question that we ask is, um, how does leashing an animal mean that it's torture? Because uh, obviously we want to explore how that person came to this conclusion, A equals B, leasing, leashing an animal is torture. Well, leasing an animal would be torture, but uh, <laughs> that's something else. But the question here would be, what information is being caused and affected? In other words, something caused B, A caused B, or equivalence. In this case, leashing equals torture. So that has got to come from certain belief patterns or value statements. Uh, what meanings are being created over here? So is leashing created as a torture or could it be viewed differently? And I know that some people could view leashing as a safety mechanism, for instance. What else can these meanings have, like what I just mentioned? So distortion patterns may or may not serve that person uh, in future times. So that's one of the reasons why we explore those patterns to figure out, number one, past examples or memories or situations that cause this person to think this way and whether this specific distortion will serve them later on in the future. Then there are generalization patterns where someone may say, all men are scum. So the question here is, has there been a man who has not been scum? Um, one of the things, again, is about taking a look at where this past generalization, which is the word all, uh, uh, which the, tr the word all triggers, and say, okay, do you really mean all? So what we're really talking about is, is there going to be a loss of possible future experiences? So when you say all men are scum, it might mean that every single human being who's male will not be someone whom you'll interact with or you'll be able to establish a relationship with or that you will create a worse off quality of life as a result of that. And in what way does this generalization limit the fullness of experience? So we will ask questions as a result of figuring out what these limits are.